Okay. Um, oh, <laughs> good afternoon. Uh, my name is Marley. I think you can hear me. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Great. Thanks so much. Um, so today I would like to discuss um, some comparisons of hybrid breeding strategies that we've done in clonal diploids and autopolyploids um, by stochastic simulation. Um, so I'm from the Excellence in Breeding program of the CGIAR. Um, and then I'm also presenting this on behalf of my colleagues who are from um, University of Wisconsin, Jeff, um, and then Bayer, which is Chris Gaynor, and Dork Sheminet, Christian Werner, and Eduardo Oberuvius Pesaron also worked on this project. Um, so this is my first time at this meeting. Uh, thank you again for the invitation to present and everything, but I, I think that these names at least are probably kind of familiar to you. <laughs> I, I think. I'm among friends. So by way of introduction, um, I, I'm sure most of you are not familiar with the Excellence in Breeding platform, but over the past three to five years, we've basically had this really cool mandate um, to work with international breeding programs across the CGIAR and um, try to give them ways that they can breed more efficiently, more effectively, and in general, answer any questions that they want. <laughs> they want to ask us. We're kind of a catch-all team. Um, so one big thing that has come up with our groups uh, is that a lot of the clonal teams um, observe heterosis in their germplasm. Um, but the ideal breeding strategy to harness that heterosis is actually not known. Uh, so we, we see really clear in heter heterosis in a lot of diverse crops. Down here in banana, um, you'll see that we have a nice a by B cross, but you can see this massive C. <laughs> um, the sweet potato team has a beautiful graph here um, showing two different pools that you end up with heterosis in. And then um, this has also been a concern in potato, um, in cassava, and in yam as well. So um, our team was tasked with coming up to an answer <laughs> for, for how, what they should be doing <laughs> with this. And those are the results I'm going to show you today. Um, I am going to start with a pretty lengthy background on what heterosis is and how I'll be defining it, because there are a lot of ways you can define it, yeah. Um, and then after that, I'm going to explain a little bit about how hybrid breeding works in diploids. So I know a lot of you think of hybrid breeding and see maize, right? And then after that, we're going to look at autopolyploids. So this is something you've all seen. Um, we pretty much consider heterosis to be due to dominance. There are cases where heterosis can be due to epistasis, and I'm kind of not going to mention this today. We've done some preliminary experiments, and um, I, I think it's safe to say you don't need to worry about epistasis too much right now. The basic idea of dominance is that at a locus that displays dominance, your heterozygote value is going to deviate from the mean of your two homozygotes, right? Very simple. So if two different parents have different allele frequencies at a locus with dominance, then their progeny is going to deviate from the average parental value. And that's mid-parent heterosis, OK? Um, it doesn't have to exceed both parents to be mid-parent heterosis. It just has to pass the mean, all right? Um, I also want to show you right away that we kind of have two sides of the coin here, where, yes, we do have sort of this beneficial homozygote or heterozygote, sorry. <laughs> But that can equally be viewed as um, just having a really bad homozygote on the other end. So that's going to be a deleterious recessive. Another thing you're going to notice here is that with a single locus, we would have to assume overdominance for the progeny to surpass the parents. So this value would have to be more like up here. But I want to show you real quick that that doesn't hold when we extend this to multiple loci. So this is the point where I think that heterosis becomes mystifying to people, because this is really cool. Um, if you have more than one locus, um, even if all of your individual loci show incomplete dominance, your progeny can exceed both of the parent values, all right? Not just that mid-parent. There's nothing genetically special about that, but I think we all feel surprised when we see that kind of transgressive segregation, okay? And then I also want to take this moment to highlight this concept of heterosis as a quantitative genetic concept, not necessarily arising from a single locus or um, even a single physiological mechanism. <clears throat> There's one other cool thing about heterosis that is specific to polyploids. I don't normally present this, but for this group, I'm absolutely going to, <laughs> um, which is that you can observe progressive heterosis due to dominance. 
So I'm sure that when some of you saw this talk or abstract today, you were like, oh, there's no way she's going to understand the complexities of the autopilot blade <laughs> heterosis, which is probably true. Um, but probably one of the major arguments that have been made that heterosis and polyploids isn't the same as heterosis and diploids has been this phenomenon of progressive heterosis. So I want to show you just real quick why that can be explained by, by dominance. Okay. Um, if we take an example where we have four different autotetraploid plants, um, let's contrive a situation where each locus has like the same additive dominance value. And they also happen to be perfectly complementary to each other. All right. So each of these has a deleterious recessive genotype, a homozygote, um, at a place where all the others have a nice, uh, the, the positive homozygote. So the mean value of this population is seven. If you do go ahead and make two single crosses among these two, we do see that nice complementation that we already observed in their progeny. And both of their progeny are gonna show mid-parent heterosis and have a value around 7.6. Now there's a cool thing with tetraploids where this isn't the most um, stacking we could do of the segregation of allelic frequencies given this population. So if you go ahead and intermate these two single crosses into a double cross, um, you do get a, a distribution here that, you know, it's not just a single genotype. Um, and the six of those are gonna carry this genotype at a given allele, four six will carry uh, this genotype <laughs> at a given allele, and one six will carry this at a given allele, and that is in all possible combinations across loci. But when you count that out, you are going to get a little bit of additional heterosis, okay, to a value 7.8. So I think this is in itself kind of exciting. Um, Jim Birchler has done beautiful work with autopolyploid um, heterosis, and um, I think that this is a cool thing to come out of that. Um, you also might feel like I came up with a really specific example here to explain that. Um, so if you'd like a more generic example that shows us at the population level, you could refer to the, the script down here and run that and check it out. So that's just an example of how heterosis can be different in polyploids, but um, we still have some evidence that it's due to dominance and directional dominance. So anyway, um, for reasons I'm not going to get into, mid-parent heterosis alone is actually not that great of a measure of heterosis in the population. The main reason for that is kind of like you saw before, like you don't really expect heterosis to always be maximized in a single cross, which is something we see right away in the polyploids. And then also um, with mid-parent heterosis, you do have different means among each set of parents. So percentage of heterosis doesn't really give you a number that makes sense in the whole population. It doesn't correspond to an amount of genetic value. So I would propose that we consider population heterosis, um, you know, loosely, <laughs> to be a difference in a population mean value due to difference in dominance value due to different frequency of heterozygous genotypes, like QTM. So the classical example of this in like Faulkner and Mackay is that if you take a base population at Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium and you measure its mean value, and then you fully inbreed it into a set of fully inbred lines, um, the difference between those values is the measure of heterosis and inbreeding depression in the population. Because it shows you how much the value of the population changes if you take out all of the heterozygosity and all of the dominance. Um, an example here is that maybe this population at Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium has a value of like four. When we inbreed it down, um, maybe that value drops to two. This is something I'm sure you all have seen <laughs> if you've tried to inbreed anything. Um, and so we lose that dominance value and um, that's due to the lack of heterozygosity. Um, I understand that, you know, and this is also like kind of a nice experimental way that you could count how much heterosis is in your population, which has been an issue for our teams. I'm not gonna go into how to do that today, but we should have some work out later uh, in collaboration with Gregor Gorianza that would give you instructions on how to measure how much heterosis you have in your population. And that's even if you can't fully inbreed your lines, which I know we can't do. <laughs> um, oh, sorry. So long story short, um, this is a nice measure of heterosis, um, but I wanna ask you if a population at Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is actually the most heterotic it could be. Is Hardy Weinberg the most heterozygous possible population that could be attained? 
oh, I hear no. <laughs> I'm not sure. I, let's say we hear no. If you said no, you're correct, right? Because Hardy Weinberg has like a 2PQ or some horrible number in the autopilot flux. Yeah, different numbers. Um, number of heterozygous, which does not indicate that, you know, every genotype in this population is heterozygous. So this is nice, but it doesn't help us understand situations where we exceed the heterozygosity of Hardy-Weinberg to create heterosis. And that is actually the type that matters in hybrid breeding and that matters in pro-recurrent selection, okay? So um, I think there's a very common misconception out there that heterosis in like maize and stuff arises from taking a fully inbred line and crossing it. That is true, that's a type of heterosis I'm going to show you. But there's another thing they do in maize, which is to cross between pools. And that's actually the type that you need to harness by hybrid breeding strategies like reciprocal recurrent selection. So this is gonna arise because if you start um, at that population in hardy weinberg equilibrium, and that gets randomly or decisively divided into two different pools, um, possibly more in probably not gonna go into that. Um, either over evolutionary time or due to breeding just by drift or due to selection on GCA with these pools, you can ultimately cross between the A and B pool and you're going to end up with a hybrid F1 that could exceed hardy weinberg equilibrium, okay? By having these two different pools, um, you're able to cross and get even more heterozygotes than you would at hardy weinberg which you normally are stuck with in a single pool because of the random mating that you're using. Okay, so this is like panmictic heterosis or interpool heterosis, so on and so forth. And this is also the kind that we immediately see if we cross between two pools in, a, in an autopolyploid or an informal crop. Um, this is a contrast from maize, where what you're looking at is actually called inbred parent heterosis, all right? So in maize, um, you know, from the base you had in two pools, then they typically go all the way down to an inbred line. Why do they do that? Seems kind of pointless, right? They know it's going to decrease the value. Well, it's because they can't clonally propagate that crop. That's the only thing they can do to get it to replicate. So this type of inbreeding, in maize at least, is totally just to make things reproducible by seed, okay? Um, it's not really a type of heterosis you care to utilize. Um, but it doesn't matter because that gets reversed and you also get that effect of pooling when you cross inbred between the two pools. So that's all fine and well. Um, it, it works fine that they do it that way too. Um, and then I, I do just want to point out um, that that baseline heterosis, um, which is the reversal from being within pools and going all the way way down to inbreds, um, yeah, we, we don't typically see that in clones, and um, it's it's not the kind that you use for hybrid breeding. So that has been a lot of talk about the assumptions we make about heterosis. Um, I understand that people define it different ways at other points in time. This is one that I think has a well-rounded um, quantitative genetic rationale. Um, I will say if you refer to the paper in the previous section, um, the equations do refer to diploids, um, so they haven't been updated to autopolyploids if someone wants a fun spring project. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and move on and talk about how we typically use heterosis in breeding and how recurrent versus reciprocal recurrent selection are going to create genetic gain. Um, if you're doing recurrent selection, um, you're going to use random mating. The typical procedure is down here. Um, you have a crossing block of a bunch of genotypes. You evaluate them, you select some, and then you recycle them back to here. Okay? And when you recycle them and do that crossing, uh, you, you do typically mate those randomly. Um, and this is really effective in increasing your frequency of favorable alleles in that population. Um, it is not as effective in increasing the frequency of heterozygous genotypes because this is limited by Hardy-Weinberg, right? That's the definition of Hardy-Weinberg, is that it, it's restored by random mating. Um, it's actually a misconception that recurrent selection, like on a breeding value, doesn't transmit any dominance. Actually, even in diploids, it will. If you think about that equation, A plus D times Q minus P, the D is in there, okay? It does partially get transmitted, but you just can't pass and to deploy that 0.5 frequency of the heterozygous genotype. And if you could, you could get more, he um, more heterozygotes and more heterosis and possibly more gain. So for this reason, um, it was proposed to instead use reciprocal recurrent selection on general combining ability. Um, and this has its unique ability to both increase those frequencies of favorable alleles, 
but also to increase the frequency of heterozygous genotypes at low site dominance to harness heterosis, okay? And you can even surpass Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium this way, like we were talking about before. Uh, so the general procedure here is you split your material into two pools. They don't have to be fully inbred. Again, there's no need for that. You cross within pools, and then after that, you cross between pools, okay? And you phenotype those hybrid, prog hybrid progeny. After that, you're going to recycle within pools, not between pools, keeping your pools separated based on an estimate of the average performance of um, a given genotype in the opposite pool. <laughs> and I can't really give you a clear explanation of how that pulls apart the allele frequencies, except to say that it does. Um, if you want to delve into those um, equations, they are really nicely laid out in Rembe et al. 2019. Um, so that was a nice summary of that. So this is cool. We have this general idea that maybe reciprocal recurrent selection could be helpful for the clonal breeding programs in the CG if they have heterosis due to dominance. I am going to show you, um, I'm going to start showing you our simulation software, and I'm going to start showing you some visuals of some of the stuff we just talked about. Um, let's consider a situation where we're doing recurrent selection in a diploid. Um, over here, we have our individuals. Down here, I'm going to track the population mean for you. And over here, we're going to look at that underlying genome. And this, I think, is nice because we have all the individuals in the population, all the QTL and markers. Um, and we're going to look to see uh, the effect of recurrent selection, not just like on an individual or a single product, but actually the whole population's genome, which I am pushing that we should call the populum. <laughs> Everyone has an own, so this could be ours. <laughs> so uh, uh, we're going to go ahead and do a simple select, uh, simulation where if we pick the best um, five or so out of this population and intermake them for 30 cycles. I forgot to mention at the beginning that the markers here are coded so that um, the good genotypes are in dark blue and the bad ones are in, in dark red. Um, so let's go ahead and see what happens to the colors. As we continue to do recurrent selection, as you expect, we make genetic gain and we see an increase in the mean value of the population. And I think you may also be noticing some changes in that whole population's genome. It's just getting bluer and bluer, right? So this is what we were talking about with that concentration of the favorable alleles. Um, over time, there's also drift in this population, so it, it does go to fixation. Um, that's not anything referencing the heterozygosity, like some of these were heterozygous while we were breeding them. But yeah, we get to a point where we try to start fixing favorable alleles, even if they're very small effect or anything like that, and it changes our, our population. So next, I'm going to show you reciprocal recurrent selection and what that's going to do to the genome, OK? Um, and I'm also going to compare it to recurrent selection. So this is a clonal breeding program. We're going to take some clones, and in the top panel up here, we're just going to select some in a single pool and then, you know, make progeny, evaluate them, and recycle. That's all we're going to do. And we're going to track the mean product value over cycles um, in this panel. Over here in this panel, we still have the populum, but instead of tracking the favorable alleles, we're just going to track the heterozygous genotypes. Okay? So everything in tan is currently a homozygote, starting off the blue ones are heterozygote. I also want to tell you, I put like a good amount of dominance in this population. It's a diploid, um, and like the Hardy Weinberg mean is 10, and then if you fully inbreed it, it's like around zero. Okay, so substantial dominance, substantial heterosis. Down here, we're going to do reciprocal recurrent selection. Um, this is sort of a situation like imagining we do genomic selection. So we're going to assume they have the same cycle length in this situation, and we're going to track that change in genetic value over time. We're also going to look at the heterozygotes and what happens to them. So let's go ahead and uh, get that started here. All right, so the population needs are increasing. Reciprocal recurrent selection is beating recurrent selection. And there's also one other thing going on. Um, you're seeing that increase in the frequencies of the hydrozygotes, okay, due to the reciprocal recurrent selection. Um, recurrent selection is doing a good job. 
It's still doing the thing in the previous panel where we saw it trying to increase the favorable alleles, but because it can't get in that excess of heterozygosity, um, it's really not keeping track with reciprocal recurrent selection. Okay. So um, this is why reciprocal recurrent selection is helpful in diploids. Um, it helps you leverage that nonlinear increase of having a copy of the alternate allele. It helps you avoid that del deleterious recessive state um, by using two pools, selecting on GCA, and getting those two pools to have divergent allele frequencies that give you a lot of heterozygotes. I know I'm beating this into the ground, but <laughs> I think people come from different backgrounds, so I, I do hope it's helpful. So it would be nice to say at this point, like all of our teams, everything's good. You should all be doing reciprocal recurrent selection if you see dominance, right? Um, but that's actually not known, even in diploids, even in diploid hybrid maze, it, it hasn't really been demonstrated that reciprocal recurrent selection is the optimal strategy, okay? Because reciprocal recurrent selection can be beat by just recurrent selection um, if its cycle length is too slow. So in the previous simulation I showed you, um, now we're going to put the year on the x-axis and compare these on a per year basis. Um, and again, look at the mean product value over that time. Um, sure, it does beat it if it's got an equal speed, if you're recycling on some kind of prediction. But typical recurrence, the reciprocal recurrence selection requires you to wait an additional season to test cross and phenotype those hybrids, right? So it's slower than recurrent selection. That's going to slow down your rate of genetic gain. So even if it only takes one additional season to complete, um, you don't see any advantages in this case until, you know, you're 25. Um, and then if anything happens that um, the length of reciprocal recurrence selection will be even longer, which is something we see in crops that have a slow multiplication ratio, like a lot of our clonals, where you have to multiply them twice if you're going to do hybrids. Yeah, that, that really is bad news, to be honest. Um, because you've slowed down your program quite a bit and you're not harnessing enough heterosis to make up for it. The other thing is that it's been posited that if you don't have enough heterosis to begin with in the population, like you inbreed and you have roughly the same uh, mean value of a trait, um, in that case, you don't really need reciprocal recurrent selection. So you can see that really clearly up here, um, where even with identical cycle lengths, um, reciprocal recurrent selection in a low heterosis population does similarly to recurrent selection. Okay. Um, interestingly, um, the, I think the definitions for breeding value of, of a GCA and in a single pool, they do converge as dominance goes to zero. So that's why they perform similarly. But sometimes it's a little bit more expensive to do reciprocal recurrent selection. Yeah, you have to like maintain separate pools. So that, that could drag, drag it down a little bit. Also, it's just complicated. So I don't know, seems, seems like a headache. So this has been the question that has begged us to look at um, for our clonal breeding programs. Like which of these should, be they, should they be doing? Um, and it's not straightforward to answer. Like we don't have clear estimates of how much heterosis is in their program and stuff like that. Um, and then, you know, not all of them can move to genomic selection and so forth. So long story short, um, we did a simulation study to look at this. Um, I know simulations can seem untrustworthy, but a cool thing about them is that we do have some kind of reference value, some kind of true baseline that we can compare things to, and they're also very cheap. <laughs> so our, our programs are also usually pretty cash strapped, so it's really nice if we can save them any time or money or effort. So to do the simulations, we use the package called AlphaSimR. This is my plug for AlphaSimR. Um, it's a great program for running breeding simulations. I think you could use it for other stuff as well. Um, but it basically takes any sort of breeding scheme and you can translate that into code pretty straightforwardly. Um, and then just look at your different responses. Um, it's fast. You can run it on your desktop. And there's also a, um, a course, a free course if you're interested that I put the link to down here from Gregor Goryansa at the Rasmus Institute. Um, and this was developed by my, my colleague, Chris, when he was, was working there. So we went into Alpha Simar, um, and I'm not going to go into a lot of the details about how the simulation works, um, but I'll tell you that we can simulate a bunch of different populations, okay? So we decided to simulation, <laughs> decided to simulate populations 
First, varying the ploidy level. Okay, this was extremely important because we have ploids and autohexaploids with our with our group. And then we varied um, like the mean dominance degree, the variance of those dominance degrees, and the number of QTL per chromosome. So these three parameters, along with linkage disequilibrium, are what basically create the amount of heterosis in the population due to dominance. Okay, so this is a framework that was also developed by Chris um, and is put forth in another paper. But the basic idea is that if you have measures of these and linkage, um, you, that creates an amount of population heterosis. As you have a higher mean dominance degree, the amount of heterosis goes up. The variance is a little complicated, and then the number of QTL as well tends to increase your heterosis as that increases. Um, I also want to remind you that, like, as far as mean dominance degree goes, like zero implies that the heterozygote is the same as the mean of the, the homozygotes. Um, and then like 0.5 would be incomplete dominance, one is complete dominance, and so forth. So some of you may be wondering if our conclusions would change if instead of considering heterosis as a monolith, we broke things down into like what the mean dominance degree is. And I'm gonna tell you that we don't think we did. We checked, but I'm not gonna show it right now. <laughs> anyway, once we did this, we had like 60 populations per ploidy, totaling 180, that all had different amounts of starting heterosis, okay? So after that, um, we did 100 cycles of breeding. We tried several different strategies. The one I'll talk today, I'll talk about today are one pool breeding value, which is like that recurrent selection we were talking about. Um, one pool cross performance, um, I'll go back to in a minute. Two pool breeding value, I'll go back to in a minute. And then two pool DCA, which is your reciprocal recurrent selection. We considered both high and low intensity programs. Today, I'm mostly gonna talk about the high intensity ones because that's what most breeding programs do because they want more genetic gain. Um, in terms of the estimation methods, we considered true values, we considered, considered genomic estimated values for each of these, and then your standard phenotypic selection. The phenotypes in the studies had heritabilities of 0.5. Um, I'll mention too, when I present the genomic results, some of you may have a lot of questions about the accuracy and how we did the models and all that. So the reason we included the true value there <laughs> was to make sure that none of the ways we did the models or all that was like substantially impacting the results. Um, and I'm not gonna show the true results, but they're roughly the same patterns as, um, as the genomic results. We also considered different sets of cycle lengths. Um, with the genomic estimated values, you can achieve the same cycle length regardless of strategy by using a prediction. And then for phenotypes, we considered those crops that can multiply pretty rapidly with the clones and the ones that take more time. I'm just gonna talk about the fast ones for now. We also equalize the costs among scenarios um, just on a per plot basis. You know, we don't, we don't have great costing information from our, our teams and stuff like that. So these are roughly similar, but results may vary. Like if you can do reciprocal recurrent selection for the same price as recurrent selection, then this, you know, this might be a little um, too heavily penalized for you or something like that. Um, I do wanna show you those breeding strategies one more time. Uh, I'm gonna show you the phenotypic ones first. So the one pool breeding value situation was what I sort of showed you before, also with the multiplication step. Um, two pool breeding value is a little bit um, probably unfamiliar to most people. We borrowed this from animal breeding. It does this cool thing where it does create pools all right, so you create a pool, you cross within it and multiply, and then you evaluate within pools, okay? You evaluate those within pool genotypes, and you recycle based on their performance within pools. That's not normally a great thing to do all the time. <laughs> um, like, it's not the same as reciprocal recurrent selection, but it does have this really nice feature of having a shorter cycle length than, okay, than our one pool breeding value, great. At the end of that all, you do cross these and you do get some heterosis because those pools diverge because of drift, all right? So this is kind of like a hybrid light <laughs> situation. Finally, with two pool GCA, you, you already know how that works. Um, and there's like a multiplication step that um, is necessary, sorry. Now, if we do, yeah, genomic selection, again, I just want you to see all the changes is we're gonna predict on Sorry, we're gonna recycle on predictions after the second stage, regardless of the breeding speed. So this is very nice. And then um, I'm, there's a strategy that we did with genomic selection that we didn't do with the phenotypic selection for various reasons. 
It's called um, Recycling on a One Pool Cross Performance. There's a paper out by Christian Werner, um, if you're interested in it, but he, he first showed that um, in diploids, you're actually better recycling on this value than a breeding value if you have dominance. Um, the basic idea is that instead of selecting individuals and mating them randomly, you calculate the expected progeny value of a cross using your marker data, and then you select crosses based on that. I know that's probably not straightforward without a visual, but if you can just trust me for a minute, um, we'll call it like a, a one pool hybrid strategy sort of thing. Um, I need to end by 2.30, is that right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> well, we are pretty, getting pretty close to done. This is kind of an intro heavy, heavy seminar. I'm gonna go ahead and show you the results. Um, so like I said, we, got all these different populations that had different initial population heterosis. A quick reminder, if you have an initial that heterosis value of 20, um, your Hardy-Weinberg mean is 20 and your uh, fully inbred genotypes have a mean zero, all right? Um, and then on this axis, we have the genetic gain. Uh, and this is after 15 years of breeding, okay? Let's start by looking at the diploids. Um, this group of solid lines refer to the genomic estimated values. This set of dashed lines refer to the phenotype scenarios. Um, I know all of you are going to want me to say <laughs> to say it, but of course the genomic situations are beating out the phenotypic ones. That's kind of old news and wasn't really the focus of our study. Um, so let's go ahead and start by looking at um, the phenotypic cases. Um, in orange, we have one full breeding value, recurrent selection. In teal, we have the two full breeding value. Oops. Um, and then in blue, we have that typical DCA. So after 15 years with phenotypic selection, we aren't seeing an amount of heterosis that we surveyed that actually justifies the use of hybrid breeding, okay? Because it is slower, it takes time for those heterotic pools to form, and it's more expensive, all right? Now that changes with the use of genomic selection. We do see a nice crossover point here, okay? Which is kind of more what we were expecting. Um, if you have not enough heterosis, then you're better off using, you know, one pool breeding value or one pool cross performance. And then there is a crossover point where those two pool strategies start to become more worthwhile. Okay, because you do have enough heterosis that it's worth it to do all of that extra effort to mask the, the recessive allele. And on top of that, you aren't losing any time because you're using a genomic prediction. All right, so this is, this is actually a huge deal, I would say. Um, and it becomes even more pronounced at year 50, all right? If you go out to 50 years, um, if you use a genomic estimated value, almost any value of heterosis is worth exploiting, at least under the costing parameters that we use here, okay? That's not true in the phenotypic case. We're still seeing that intersection where it's really not worth doing hybrid breeding unless you have enough heterosis. So this was very cool for us because there's an interaction between um, what type of breeding you're doing and what strategy is attainable for you, all right? So genomic selection isn't just reducing your cycle length, it's also unlocking this whole caveat of strategies for how you can use heterosis in your program. So that was pretty cool. <laughs> uh, we were excited to see it. Um, I'd like to comment more, but I wanna move on for the sake of time. This trend was not as clear across ploides, all right? So this is that, that plot I just showed you, the same deal. But instead of looking at just the diploids, let's go ahead and look at the autotetraploids and the hexaploids. And I did spend a lot of time on the diploids just because I wanted you to see that this sort of works as expected <laughs> in the diploids. It's about what you'd see in maze or something like that. Well, not necessarily, but anyway. If we go ahead here and look at our, um, Auto tetraploid, we surveyed, surveyed higher values of heterosis in that auto tetraploid. Um, but actually, even if the amount of heterosis is quite high, we don't see that advantage to reciprocal recurrent selection. Okay. So um, it, it does get up there. Um, and like, I, I mean, there's certainly marginal advantages at really high values of heterosis, but it's not like the situation in the diploid where you unilaterally will benefit from using heterosis. Um, in the autohexaploid, that's like even a little bit more clear. Um, we're seeing that blue line drop a little bit farther down between your, um, your uh, orange, or, orange or blue ones, which are both single pool strategies. Um, 
So long story short, there's, there's just not that gain that we were seeing in the diploids as far as we can tell. I will say some of these differences are pretty marginal, you know, and some of them are sensitive to costing. So I, I would say it's not so much that, um, you know, the other strategies are doing better than hybrid breeding. It's just that hybrid breeding is like kind of unnecessary. <laughs> it's not that it's that much worse. It's not that big of a deal. If you really want to do it, like, okay, I don't know. Um, but it's not doing the same thing as, that, as it would in the deploy, okay? Um, I will also highlight for practical purposes, um, you may see that if you aren't doing hybrid breeding, you still might not want to be selecting on breeding value, okay? The orange line is the breeding value right here. And you'll see that you do tend to get a bit of a bump um, by using a cross performance instead. So um, I will talk more about that if you'd like during the, the questions, uh, not the questions, but the, um, the office hours that are a little bit later today. I can like set you up with scripts for that if you'd like and stuff like that. Um, I also wanna show you before we conclude here soon, um, that even though that had a, the uh, reciprocal recurrent selection strategy wasn't providing us a lot of benefits, it absolutely did build heterosis. Okay, it absolutely built heterosis between those pools, um, and more so as there was more heterosis available. So if you were to do, you know, some kind of two-pool breeding value or two-pool GCA selection in a hexaploid, you would end up with interpool heterosis. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that's a necessary strategy. So um, I think that we've kind of had teams say to us, like, I'm observing heterosis, so I need to be doing hybrid breeding. And like that seems so logical, but it's um, not quite true, I'd say. Um, so one beautiful example right here, I, I think this is one of the only examples of an auto polyploid hybrid breeding program. So regardless, that's to be celebrated. Um, you can see a really great example of um, those two pools in sweet potato that are crossing to produce heterosis. Um, this kind of arose when these two pools got separated by chance a long time ago. So they drifted apart as they increased in value. And now you do see that heterosis when you cross them. That's not really to say that that's a better solution than breeding in one pool or even bringing them back into one pool and so forth. Um, but that's sort of that team's business. I'm just using it as an example because it really is the best one that I know of. You know, there's so few people who are even thinking about this. All right, we're almost at time. So I'm going to go very quickly through the discussion. I think it will be doable because the reason that hybrid breeding isn't needed in auto polyploids is actually very simple. And the reason is that your auto polyploids are always more heterozygous <laughs> than the diploids. Okay? And everyone's nodding because I'm sure you all deal with this every day, right? Um, if you self an auto polyploid, like it doesn't go to that nice one to two to one ratio you see in a diploid. No, no, not happening. And that basically arises because of um, the way gametes are inherited, right? You always in inherit those multiple gametes. Um, because you do have multiple chromosome copies per gamete, um, regardless of what you do to an autopolyploid, like how you made it or anything like that, um, you're just less likely to have that homozygous progeny genotype. So a quick exam example is if we self um, the most heterozygous possible gene type at either a diploid, on a tetraploid, or on a hexaploid level, you all know these ratios very well, right? Um, in, in, your, in your diploid, upon the selfing generation, uh, half your genotypes are now homozygous. And then on a tetraploid, with one selfing generation of this genotype, like only 6% of your genotypes are, are homozygous, right? Um, so in general, it's much harder to observe those deleter deleterious recessives, even if you're just like randomly mating and pushing a uh, breeding value in a single pool. It's even smaller without a hexaploid. That does extend to the population level. Um, you can look at this later if you'd like, um, but in general, in the population, you're less li likely to see heterozygous. Um, I'm going to skip this theory and mention it at the end because I want to show this to you. Um, let's go back to that simulation where we looked at how um, heterozygosity will accumulate in diploids if, with a response to reciprocal current selection. Um, so the within pool genotypes, sorry, are in the bottom two panels, and then your hybrid genotype is in the top right panel. All right, so let's just watch this real quick. I know I'm short on time. I am almost done. <laughs> Two more slides. So that diploid, like we said, is accumulating heterozygosity. 
I will say it's not optimal for it to be completely heterozygous with incomplete dominance, but over the breeding scales that we use, linkage will typically prevent you from stacking all the good alleles. So you are better off keeping those heterozygous over a normal breeding time period. But now let's look at the uh, hex point. Wow. The blue is the heterozygous. So this autohexaploid is more heterozygous <laughs> than that diploid was even after years of breeding, okay? So it is very heterozygous and um, let's see, yeah, with reciprocal recurrent selection, um, we, we do see the value of the population increasing, but in some ways it's, it's not because it's increasing heterozygosity, but actually because it's going to those white favorable homozygous states, okay? So you're able to do that to increase that frequency of favorable alleles while maintaining the heterozygous genotype, even with random mating or even with a simple solution like one pool cross performance. All right. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to show this slide as well <laughs> because um, you can see that that's true, that, that that trend is true with both reciprocal recurrent selection or recurrent selection. Um, so we don't have a situation where we're depleting that heterozygosity just by accident with recurrent selection. Okay, so in conclusion, um, we, we don't think that the clonal autopolyphies really need RRS, um, even if there's a lot of heterosis. So heterosis doesn't mean hybrid breeding all the time. Um, you might wanna look at using a genomic estimated cross performance um, just to be safe. If you're using phenotypic selection, breeding value is all in well. Um, but we, with the phenotypic selection, hybrid breeding is not useful even for the diploids, just because it does take so long, okay? Uh, so that's nice. Now, all these conclusions are sensitive to program inbreeding rate, which um, I won't have time to get into. But I would love to talk with you more if you're interested in using any of these strategies um, at, at the office hours. Um, I can also set you up with um, Alpha Samar. I could try to help you install it or anything like that. And I can point you to the script for uh, genomic prediction across performance, because I imagine some of you would actually maybe want to use that. Thank you so much for your attention and the time to speak. <laughs>